They're going to bring up the gun again, Senator. Sure. I'll hop out with anybody. <laughs> Rex, thank you so much. Just by way, this is sort of unique in a sort of like circle. I'll just like take one minute of your time though. Uh, according to my family history, there was uh, an individual that served in the Union forces. Uh, my son's name is Nathaniel, and sort of as an as an homage to that ancient individual whose name was Nathaniel Green, he was actually a Sawbones, and they came from upstate New York, and so sort of nice being able to be on the other side of the cannon as opposed to picking up all the wounded on, on the, the, the downside. <laughs> There's no line down here, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Did you have one more? Huh? You're next. All right. <laughs> so of course we're firing black powder, which is potassium nitrate. Uh, charcoal, sulfur, and of course it had to be mixed with, with water. And again, the real key ingredient in this process was the charcoal. 15% of the mixture was charcoal, 75% was potassium nitrate, and 10% was, was sulfur. You also have to know, you know where you are. There were buildings here everywhere. This is a vast operation, 500 acres stretching almost two miles. So you're just seeing a small part of it. You really need to you know, to get a grasp of this, you have to hike it like Ralph and Mr. Caporetto have done to know how vast it is, how far down this goes. But there's, there were what, Ralph, all here were sheds attached to the barn. Right back here, there's a blast wall that still remains. This is the site where the worst accident took place, right over there, where eight people were killed. We'll be walking upstream, and there's a mill called Man Killer that only killed three. But, so I don't know why it's called Man Killer, because this is where the most horrific explosion took place, down over here. Colonel, he's up ready. As you are, oh well, my good corporal, on your command. I'm Norbert Ricky of Northampton, Massachusetts. All right, no Northampton. We love going to Northampton all the time. Uh, enjoy sitting out at the, uh, the uh, Northampton uh, the, ho the hotel there and having a nice uh, repast on a nice Saturday afternoon. Now, which kind of Civil War reenactor? What role do you play as a Civil War reenactor? Uh, my my role is sergeant of the battery. Um, I take care of the limber of the piece, make sure all the men get drilled properly, know their jobs and uh, they do their jobs. Very good. And, you, and could you spell your name again? Just so I, if I put it in an article, I have it correct. Holland Jenkins, H-O-L-L-A-N-D. Last name is Jenkins, J-E-N-K-I-N-S. From Palmer, and sir? I am Norbert Ricky. N-O-R-B-E-R-T, Ricky, R-I-E-K-E. -E. Oh, I would never have spelled it that way. Mm -hmm. All right, and what role do you play? When I'm in the unit, I'm a gunner, I'm a corporal. Okay. okay when we do living histories, I become the battery surgeon. And we have to set up a full medical display with the operating instruments, etc. And I clarify to people the, what civil war medicine is really like. And as I had indicated, Nathaniel, my son, is named after, I don't know how many greats are in there, but way back in the family history during the Civil War from upstate New York, a sawbones named Nathaniel Green was in my family lineage, one of my great, 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 great grandfathers. And I always considered that to be sort of like a not a great job and that maybe those folks really weren't too good at medicine because they're just taking big old saws and sawing off no, limbs, no, no, but you say that's it's wrong. It's totally misunderstood. The, their surgical technique was excellent, okay? Uh, they had anesthesia. They used anesthesia 99% of the time. Uh, and only the best surgeons did the cutting. Okay, they were not sawing knife happy. If they could save a limb, they would. They only amputated because they had to. The type of ammunition used far too often had to amputate. 
they had to operate very quickly, very precisely, because they were fighting against time. We have no heart monitors or anything like that. So when we put the lad under, we know we can only keep him under for a very limited amount of time or he'll die. And they knew this. So we had anesthesia, good surgical technique, our, phar our pharmacology was <laughs> pathetic by our standards, and of course we knew nothing about infection control or sterile technique. Lister does not publish the after 1865, and had we had Lister's work, we probably could have saved thousands of them. So Nathaniel Green, if you volunteered from upstate New York and fought in some of these battles, he probably was a very good physician. He was a very good physician and a very brave man. The medical corps took the same percentage of casualties as any other part of the army. Wow. And the, the other interesting thing I learned today regarding the uh, cannonades and the firing is that we always see reenactments, or at least in the movies, where the shell hits the ground and then explodes. And you had indicated to me earlier today that that's not the case. That is not the case. 90% of the time, uh, most of the shells were exploding shells. They would have a trajectory. They would have elevation. They would know exactly where to put it. Um, in the artillery, the people that were in the artillery had to be graduates. They had to be educated. And um, that's what separated the infantry from the artillery and how they would, they would get there. Um, these shells would explode in the air, so they would know exactly how far to do that. Um, a solid shell would, would explode, but that would be to take out a piece of equipment or something and be used for that. But really short, it's only time that that would happen. Okay. Most of the time you want an air burst, because you get the maximum bang for the buck. Because if you do a ground burst, the cone goes up, okay? Right. And you're not going to hit that many people. But an air burst, the cone goes down, and all that shrapnel and projectiles going into the enemy infantry, and that's what we're gunning for. And, that, and the last part of this story is the canister. Each set of cannoneers equipment had a couple shots of canister, and that's yeah. and, and I, I think what I learned was that that is used at the end when the other troops are right on you, and it almost goes out like a shotgun blast. Yeah. Very yeah, much so. Um, today, what we call buckshot in a very large amount would be canister. Well, thank you. I wanted to make sure that we recorded this during our reenactment here and our tour of uh, Augustus Hazard's uh, area here in Hazardville, Connecticut. Uh, uh, hold on. Holland, yes. my pleasure. Norbert, my pleasure. And thank you for filming this, Nathaniel. <laughs>